So, I suppose most people know me, I'm Francis Heil, and I'm the director of the Global Brain Institute and the Echo Evolution Complexity and Cognition Research Group here at the Vrije Universiteit Brussel. But this is a work I did with quite a number of colleagues, most of whom are also members of the ECHO group. Uh, Marta Lanautovic, who is here. Uh, Kate Kingsbury, who is not directly a member of the <coughs> VUB, but who works at the Department of Anthropology <coughs> at the University of Alberta in Canada. Shima Beji is also a member of our group, and Jo von Hansen, though she will probably start working in an institute in Germany soon. So, social systems programming, it sounds kind of uh, mysterious. Let me try to explain first what the social systems are. Note that we used in the beginning this abbreviation SS, but then in the paper we decided to take it out because it had too many negative connotations. But still, I think that the abbreviation is useful, and even the negative connotation is useful because we use it in a kind of bit of a negative sense. So, a social system is not, as people might think, just a collection of human individuals. A social system does not consist out of people. A social system consists out of the rules that coordinate the activities of those people. So, the social system is actually something abstract. It's not the people themselves. It's what governs the way these people interact with each other. So, a system is something that tells you how to do, to systematically do things, so it's what determines the way people interact with each other. It consists of rules, and these rules they specify what somebody should do in a particular circumstance. And that is something we can very easily represent formally. It's a notation I got from artificial intelligence, it's called a condition action rule. And a condition action rule says, if you are in some condition A, then you perform some action B, where B is supposed to be the appropriate reaction to the condition A. For example, if you meet a friend, then you normally greet him. That's part of the social rules. On the other hand, if you're a soldier in the war and you see enemies, then your rule says that you should try to kill those enemies. If you meet your boss, then the rule says you should obey what your boss says, by definition of being a boss. So, I speak about rules, but we can use some near synonyms, norms, expectations, conventions, standards. A social system is built out of these kind of rules that tell people how they should behave. Now, we come to a more difficult concept, which is the concept of autopoiesis. And the idea of applying autopoiesis to social systems comes from the sociologist Niklas Luhmann. So he defines social systems as autopoietic networks of communications. Now, we have in our work slightly generalized this notion of communication. We speak about social actions, where a social action means an action that I perform that has some effect on other people in the social system. Something I do completely independently, for example, if I sketch my hair and nobody's there to see me sketching my hair, it's not a social action, so it's not necessarily rule-governed. But I assume that these social actions are governed by rule. Now, what does it mean, autopoietic? The meaning autopoiesis means self-production. So the system should produce itself. It's a concept that was originally proposed by Maturana and Varela to describe living organisms. Luhmann has applied it to social systems, but the meaning is more or less the same. That means that we have this network of actions, and these actions are such that they engender new actions, which in turn engender new actions, which engender new actions, but in the end they engender the same actions. So the system rebuilds itself. And to use a terminology from a very uh, handy um, formalism that I use, chemical organization theory, we can say that we can split up out of this in two aspects, self-maintenance and closure. The self-maintenance means that all the actions that are part of the system eventually are produced again, so there are no actions that get lost, it maintains the actions that are there, 
and it is closed. That means all the actions it produces are actions that fulfill the rules of the system. It does not produce new actions. <coughs> so, how could we imagine an autopoietic network if these are all actions and an action has a certain input condition and produces certain output conditions? that are then transformed by other actions in new actions and new actions and new actions but in the end they loop back, that means everything eventually comes back the system is closed in a kind of an operational sense in the sense that the actions produce themselves it's not physically closed in the sense that there is of course some influence from the outside and there will be some influence on the outside but these things that go out, they are not part of the system now, we come to this maybe a little bit controversial idea that the social system behaves like a parasite. How can we say that? Well, an autopoietic system originally was posited by Maturana as, Carella as the definition of life. A living organism is an autopoietic system. Now, if we transport this notion to a social system, then we can say that this social system is in some sense a living organism. That means it's something that tries to maintain itself and to survive. So, what's also characteristic of an autopoietic system is that it distinguishes itself from its environment. It creates a kind of a boundary that separates what is in the self from what's out of the non-self or the environment. And it tries to maintain that self. So, that's the implicit goal. Maintaining itself means that if something happens that would perturb this maintenance, this, this network of process is a perturbation, it should suppress that. And if it needs certain resources to keep that activity going, it will need to use these resources. Now, what are the resources of the social systems? These are human beings. By definition, a social system is an interaction, a network of interactions between humans. So these humans need to act to keep the social system going. So it exploits human activity. It needs human activity as basic resource. So what are some examples of this parasitic behavior? Now, in say, using human resources does not necessarily mean it's parasitic. It can return resources in turn, and in fact, we might say that social systems, of course, also have beneficial aspects. They help people. They do good by, for example, helping people to coordinate, to collaborate, to stop crime or to reduce crime, to reduce internal conflicts. But on the other hand, they make people do things that are really detrimental. And this is a list of things that are detrimental for the people, but good for the social system. So that's what a parasite does. A parasite does things that are detrimental to its host, but in order to profit from it. So, what are some examples of these detrimental actions? Well, we know all about sacrifices and offerings that people make to the divinities. These divinities are actually kind of abstractions of the social order. They sacrifice food, they sacrifice animals, and in Many societies they even sacrifice human beings. We also know that people sometimes are pushed by the social system to kill themselves, to give up their own life, the kamikaze pilots in the Second World War, and now more recently the suicide bombers of IS. The social system also pushes people to kill others, others that for some reason did not follow the rules, and that's often what we call homo kinnics. Somebody in a society that didn't follow the rules of that society is then killed by, often by their own family members. You also have what we might call honor suicide, that means people who have transgressed the rules of the system are kind of morally obliged to commit suicide. That's a famous Japanese harakiri. The system will also uh, single out certain classes of people, like for example priests, to be celibates. They cannot reproduce themselves. It will sometimes even push people to uh, uh, harm themselves by, for example, self-flagellation, self-mutilation. It will suppress their sexual desires and all kinds of other things by telling them to not to do all kinds of things, like putting all kinds of taboos on things that are intrinsically pleasurable for the people. 
you know, particularly in our capitalistic system, it will create a system where you're forced to consume ever more resources just to keep the system going. So these are all things which obviously are not good for the people who participate in it. But they are good for the social system in the sense that they help the system to sustain itself. They all confirm, they reinforce the workings and the authority of the system. Some more concrete examples are the power of the social system to make people do things that are really against their best interests. There are some classical examples in social psychology of experiments, and one of the most famous ones is the experiment of Stanley Milgram, where he put people in a situation where supposedly they were going to uh, teach others to do certain things, and if these others didn't give the right answer, they should get an electric shock. And he had set it up so that as they made more and more bad answers, they should get heavier and heavier shocks. And the machine was set so that certain shocks were clearly marked as lethal, and people were obedient enough to follow the rules of the experiments, where they were willing to go up to the lethal shocks. So that is obedience, and it's obedience in this case not so much to the experimenter who set up the experiment, but to the social situation which says that there is a certain authority, there is something like a scientific experiment that has an authority to tell you what you should do and what you shouldn't do, and you follow that authority. Now, when I looked for obedience, I thought that I might find some photos of that experiment, and I found some photos of the experiment, the photos were not very clear, but I was surprised to find lots of photos with very positive things about obedience. God rewards obedience. Whom should I obey first? What all <laughs> this shows is that the social system is still using its concept of obedience, the social system, because God is an abstraction. God is an abstraction of the social system. So God rewards obedience. What they actually mean is the social system rewards obedience. There's another classic experiment done by Solomon Ash, and it's very simple. You put a group of people, supposedly an experiment about perception, you show them this line, and then you show them these three lines, and then you ask them to indicate which of the three, A, B, or C, has the same length as this line. Now, I think everybody will agree that C is the right one, and that A and B are wrong. But now, in the experiment, the group of supposedly experimental subjects, there's only one real experimental subject, all the others are collaborators of the experiment, and these collaborators all claim, let's say, that B is the right one. And what happens is that the experimental subject, who first, of course, said C is the right one, when he heard that all the others were saying B, he so it's big, yeah, yeah, maybe it's B. And he would also say B. And actually afterwards they showed that some people just did it because they didn't dare to be too different from the others. But some people really started to believe that it was B. So that's an experiment that shows how strong the pressure of conformity is that people will even reject what they see with their own eyes in order to do what the social system tells them to see. How do they check if they really believe in it? Uh, I don't know the details, but there, there was. The, the, I, I think that they afterwards asked people to uh, motivate why they said it, and then maybe uh -huh. gave them the chance to to come back to their old yeah. to their old ideas. And uh, some of them really seemed to have gotten convinced <coughs> that it was the other one. <coughs> so. A further examples of the power of social systems is that they not just determine our behavior in concrete situations, they determine what we call our worldview. Our worldview is kind of the general way we structure reality. That's to say, what are the major categories of existence? Like you can have mind and matter, or you could have the transcendent and the lower earths. These are the kind of fundamental distinctions out of which we make our world. 
And then, once I understand the world, how should I behave in that world? What is my role, my identity? What, what should I do within this larger system? What is my purpose in life? All this is what we call a world view in the Santelier Apostle, and all this is actually provided normally by the social system. So, that has been called a long time ago by sociologists the social construction of reality. So, the social system will actually define what reality is. It will tell you what are the basic categories out of which things exist, and it will tell you these are the things that really exist, and then it will tell you the rules. If something is material, then you should behave like it in that way, and if something is spiritual, then you should behave like it in that way, and if something is alive, you should treat it in this way, and if something is not alive, you should treat it in that way. So it makes these basic distinctions, and then collects each of these distinctions to particular values or particular behaviors. Now, another big disadvantage of the social systems is that not only they make you do particularly things that may be detrimental, but more generally, they limit your freedom. So, a social system doesn't want you to think for yourself, doesn't want you in the sense that the implicit goal of a social system is to reproduce what is already there, to follow the rules. So, thinking for yourself means that you might come to the conclusion that those rules actually are not the right ones and that you should not treat these living or non-living things in this way or that way, but that maybe you should treat them in a different way. So, thinking for yourself is dangerous to the social system because it means that you are able to get outside of the rules and that endangers the autopoiesis of the system. That means the system would need to accommodate, would have to change, would no longer be the same system. So therefore, inbuilt in social systems that tend to endure is some methods to suppress these differences, these non-conformist thoughts, these creative thoughts. So people are not allowed to develop their unique personalities the way they want, what some have called their authentic selves. Instead, they're supposed to develop in a prescribed role as a father, as a mother, as a boss, as a soldier, as a general. They have prescribed roles and they're supposed to behave the way these roles are filled in. And that is what has been called the false self. The false self is the identity that has been imposed upon you by the social system, but it's not really who you are. So some Simple examples of this suppression of self-actualization. Self-actualization is the drive every person has to maximally develop their own unique personality. Suppose we have a common rule in social systems that women should behave as housewives. They are there to look after the children, to look after their husband, to do all the little jobs in the world, in the, in the house. They're not supposed to do ambitious things outside the house. And in particular, women are not supposed to be busy with science or mathematics or engineering. Women are supposed not to have any talent or any interest in these domains. Now suppose that I have a woman called Anna who has a particular talent for mathematics. <clears throat> now, what are her choices? She can obey the rule of the social system so she becomes the housewife and forgets all about mathematics, what will happen? She will basically be frustrated. She will constantly have the feeling that something is lacking in her life. She will be bored. She will not be able to develop her potentialities. And she will not be able to help society in what she intrinsically is best at. Maybe she could solve some big mathematical problem, but she simply can't. So that's one option. The other option is that she rebels against the rule and says, I don't care what people think about me, I'm going to become a mathematician. So she becomes a mathematician, and maybe she's even a successful mathematician, but the likely outcome is, because of the social system programming, that she will suffer from all kinds of psychological problems, self-doubts, because the system has programmed her not to be a mathematician, so she will start doubting about herself and having feels, maybe feels of guilt because she didn't look after her family, or shame 
because she hasn't done what is expected of her and she's not yet married and doubt about themselves or what has been called the imposter syndrome which is people who have succeeded in a difficult job and who think that it was purely by luck that they succeeded and who expect that they will be found out sooner or later as imposters that's to say people who are actually incompetent it's a very common psychological uh, problem and one of my students is going to make a thesis about that so I'm curious what she will find out another uh, even more simple example is in most social systems homosexuality is something you should not show you should not perform acts of homosexuality so suppose that a man John is a homosexual if he follows the rule well or if he doesn't follow the rule, anyway, he will suffer again from his shame, guilt, etc. So what do I mean by programming? So the rules of the social system need to be imposed on the people. Imposed, that means in a way that they obey these rules unthinkingly. And we will see a number of methods of programming conditioning narratives, conformisms, and ritualization. And the second part is that people should not only be programmed to follow the rules, you should also make sure that they don't deviate from the rules, because even if you're well programmed, maybe to some exceptional circumstances you may be inclined to deviate from the rule, and then you need control mechanisms, that's to say, mechanisms that suppress deviations, and there we will see uh, different emotions. So first, the basic rule of programming is what has been called by behaviorist psychologist conditioning, and which is now more commonly known as reinforcement learning. So that's how behaviorists have discovered that it's very easy to teach rules to animals, but just as well to people. And the rule is the way to teach a rule is very simple. So you have a condition action rule. For example, in the case of this rat, you would like the rat to learn to push that lever. How do you do that? If the rat by chance pushes the lever, you give the rat a reward, typically food. If the rat doesn't do what it is supposed to do, suppose that there would be some other lever there and it pushes the wrong lever, then you punish the rat. So you give it an electric shock. Now, it has been shown that this is a very effective, very efficient way to teach the rat to push the right lever and not to push the wrong lever. So, that's the basic way of teaching behavior. But that's the same way that behavior is taught to people in society. From the moment that children start doing things, parents will either reward them or punish them, depending on whether they do the appropriate thing or the inappropriate thing. Now, Rewarding and punishing doesn't need to be something as harsh as giving an electric shock. It can just be smiling if the child did something nice and looking angrily when the child did something wrong. It's sufficient that the child can distinguish between a positive, an acknowledgement, a recognition, a reinforcement, and a negative a kind of a suppression. Now, this mechanism of reinforcement learning, uh, more recently we have learned that this seems to happen through a neurotransmitter in the brain called dopamine. And the dopamine is what acts as the equivalent of the reward. The dopamine is a neurotransmitter that gives a feeling of pleasure, pleasure and that therefore motivates a repetition of the behavior that releases dopamine. So, if you do an activity and it leads to something that gives you pleasure, then you will tend to do that same activity again. Vice versa, if you do something that gives you pain or displeasure, you will avoid that. But dopamine has been found to play a role in addictions. Because typically addictive activities like gambling or social media checking or using cocaine, all of those give you boosts of dopamine. And it's because people are expecting these boosts of dopamine that they will do it again. So why do you take your smartphone and check it? Because there might just be a little 
notes for one of your funds that you like and it will give you a little bit boost of dopamine. Even if there is no note of your funds, your brain will still anticipate that maybe the next time there will be this little note of your fund. So that's why you're constantly checking. And it's sufficient that only from time to time there is the reward that comes to continue the behavior. So in a sense, we might say that participating in a social system is addictive because a social system is what constantly gives you this little boost, this little acknowledgement. You get a reaction from the other person, that reaction confirms that you did something appropriate. So it's a little boost, so you don't want to lose that. So you want to always be part of the system. And there's even a, a, a new term for that FOMO, the fear of missing out. If your friends are doing some activity, you wouldn't want to be outside of that, even if you're not in any way excluded, but just the fact that they are doing it and you are not, it makes you kind of already feel uncomfortable. The classical conditioning in, the, in, in psychology works with immediate rewards. But you don't need an immediate reward. You don't even need a material reward, as I already said, just an acknowledgement is sufficient. But you can also think about an anticipated reward. If you anticipate that you will get the reward, you already get a bit of dopamine. That's also being proven. So if you have learned that a certain behavior will be followed at some future stage by a reward, well, that behavior will already be a little bit rewarding because of the anticipation. So how have social systems used that property? By creating narratives. Narratives are stories in which some protagonist does certain things, and when he does the good things, he gets a reward, when he does the bad things, he gets a punishment. So the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden who ate the forbidden fruit, that was clearly something bad they did, they disobeyed the gods, they wanted to have knowledge, and therefore they were punished by shame, and they had to become, uh, they had to cover their nakedness, it's typically the kind of story that social systems use to uh, uh, transmit the message that you should follow the rules, even if there is no immediate reward or punishment for that. So, these narratives, for example, the scripture, the Bible, the Koran, different myths, movies, stories, they all kind of illustrate how you're supposed to behave, because in these stories, some character that you can easily identify with behaves in the right way and gets rewarded or behaves in the wrong way and gets uh, punished. He goes to heaven or he burns in hell. A further mechanism uh, that reinforces is conformist transmission. So, conformist transmission is actually very simple. It is just that if people pass on a certain message to you, the more people pass it on to you, the more likely you are to adopt it. And the more likely you are to adopt it, the more likely you are to pass it on yourself. So it just means that messages that are transmitted a lot get transmitted even more until everybody transmits it. So what you get then is that within a group you get a homogeneous culture where everybody is constantly reinforcing the same things. While in another group, where they started out from a slightly different uh, uh, distribution of opinions, they may settle to a completely different kind of system and their construction of reality may be completely different. Uh, a last mechanism of this programming, uh, the cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is a concept that uh, denotes the situation where you have beliefs that are mutually contradictory or inconsistent. You believe on the one hand that the earth is flat, on the other hand that you can take a satellite and uh, circle around the earth. Those two things, you cannot really believe them both at once. So the moment you become aware of this inconsistency, there is a dissonance. And According to the theory of cognitive dissonance, that's an unpleasant feeling. So you try to get rid of that by typically of the different things that are contradictory, rejecting or ignoring some and keeping the ones that are consistent. 
So now a social system can easily use this mechanism by creating a situation where you may have some non-conformist beliefs, this is to say beliefs that don't fit into the social system, and then the social system makes you do something that is consistent with the social system, and now you have two inconsistent things in your mind, one conforming to the system, one non-conforming, and then typically the system that work, that wins. And I give you an example, I think it's a classic example, suppose that a young man is recruited in the army, and that young man has as a moral principle that you should not kill human beings. But he doesn't have much choice, it's war, he's recruited in the army, <laughs> once in the army he is confronted with enemies and he has to shoot them, and now he has a deep problem of his conscience, he believes it's wrong to kill human beings, but he has killed human beings. How can he resolve this tension? By shifting his beliefs, namely to the beliefs of the social system, and the social system will tell him, it's no problem to shoot those soldiers, they were enemies, they are not really human, they are vermin, they are invaders, they are, uh, uh, they are rapists, you shouldn't in any way be uh, ashamed to kill them, it's your task to kill them. So, that's typically what will happen. He cannot deny the fact that he has killed those enemy soldiers. It's much easier to deny his previous belief that they were human beings and just say, well, yeah, probably they weren't really human beings. So now I go to the, in a sense, most interesting mechanism, and that's the mechanism of co-opting emotions. So, why are emotions so important? Because emotions are very deep, intense uh, forms of making people do things. When you have an emotion, it's not rational, you can't reason about it. You do it because there is this kind of instinct to react. So if a social system can co-opt an emotion, and co-opting means using the emotion for something else than what the emotion originally evolved for, then the social system will get much more power. So what these emotions then become? They become tools to ensure that people obey the rules without critically reflecting about them. And to do that, even when there is nobody to look at them, when there is no outside social system to remind them that they should do this or not to do that, these emotions will be internalized and they will feel bad if they do things against the rule and they will feel good if they do things for the rules, even if there's nobody there to tell them that it's good or bad. So the first and simplest emotion that you can use to control people is fear. You want them not to do certain things, you just make them afraid of doing those things. So what are the kind of things that in social systems you should be afraid of? So fear is an anticipation of a negative outcome and it's the desire to avoid that outcome. So what are the kind of outcomes that the social system would like you to avoid? Obviously, transgression of the rules. And the transgression of the rules, how can you make people fear this transgression of the rules? By threatening with a punishment. So a punishment that could be for a child being sent to bed without food, for somebody in trafficking could be receiving a fine from a traffic agent, or it could be for somebody maybe in Afghanistan who had an affair with somebody she's not married to, to be stoned to death. You have a whole range of punishments, and the one is more frightening than the other. There's also a more abstract kind of punishment, and that is called ostracism, and ostracism means being excluded from the system. In the old days, exclusion from the system basically meant that you would starve because on your own you wouldn't be able to get all the food and the protection that you need. Nowadays, ostracism is more gentle in the sense that people will just ignore you. They will not literally throw you out, but it's still a very painful feeling and it's 
you probably have an instinct of being very much afraid of ostracism. And finally, another form of fear that is used a lot by social systems is xenophobia, that means fear of strangers. And why would a social system induce fear of strangers? Because strangers, by definition, are outside of the social system. That is to say, people who do not follow the rules. And if they do not follow the rules, yeah, then they may destroy social systems. So you should a priori be afraid of others that do not follow the rules. Small illustration of the ostracism. Ostracism nowadays happens a lot in high schools that some adolescent, for whatever reason, is considered not to follow the norms of the local social system. Maybe she isn't dressed in the right kind of way. Maybe she's not dressed, she's not wearing the right kind of designer clothes. Or maybe she's not listening to the right kind of music. Or like in the case of my daughter, maybe she's wearing socks in her sandals. Well, everybody else says that <laughs> if you wear sandals, you should never wear socks in your sandals. But that leads to ostracism, that means you have little groups that have their norms, and those who don't follow the norms are excluded. They are not allowed to participate in the group. Has she given in? No, <laughs> she's too rebellious for that. <laughs> what was that? But her, her, her group is pretty, uh, is pretty lenient. Next uh, emotion that is used to manipulate people is guilt. So I try to find a, a picture that <laughs> illustrates guilt. You will see the difference with the next picture where I will show shame, because guilt and shame are often confused. And look, her expression is a bit an expression of fear. It's an expression of fear and of uncertainty, like I did something, what's going to happen? No, I shouldn't have done it. The hands are the fingers of the social system that others point out that she has done something wrong. But guilt does not necessarily need to come from others. So what is guilt in general? Guilt is a fear of a retribution for bad action. Retribution is a more kind of abstract term for punishment. But retribution is the idea of we are in a group where there is a sense of reciprocity. If I do something good for you, I expect that sooner or later you will do something good for me. If I don't do something bad to you, I expect that sooner or later you will do something bad to me. So it is a very deeply built instinct of reciprocity or fairness that you kind of expect that you get what you deserve. So if you did something bad to somebody, you have kind of the expectation that something bad will come back. So, how can you avoid getting the punishment or getting the attribution by redeeming yourself? Redeeming means originally buying yourself back. That means doing something that compensates for the bad thing you do. In the simplest case, you said something nasty to somebody, you apologize. You said, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Or you did something worse, you broke somebody's bike, and you say, I'll buy you a new bike. You compensate the victim. Once you have done that, the victim no longer has any reason to retribute, to take a revenge against you. So you can be calm, you can forget about it, you no longer have to be anxious. So that's how guilt normally works. Guilt in say is a healthy instinct, it's an instinct that just tells you try not to uh, harm other people because they may in turn harm you. So if by accident or by intent you do harm somebody, try to make it up, try to set the record straight. In say a healthy emotion. But now social systems have co-opted that emotion for purposes that were not there, let's say, initially in the natural form of guilt. And so, how can the social system do that? By making people feel guilty 
even if they haven't done anything wrong, or at least not anything wrong in terms of harming somebody else. But social systems, of course, they define themselves what is wrong or right. So they may, for example, define that if you ever doubt that God exists, then you have committed a horrible sin and you should feel very guilty for doubting God's existence. Or maybe you were sexually attracted to somebody who is not your wife or your husband. That's again a sin. You should feel guilty for that. Or maybe, to use an example that came from uh, our colleague Kate, suppose you are a man and you like sometimes to dress up in women's clothes and you do that in your home, own home. Nobody sees that you don't harm anybody. Well, if you had the traditional education within the social system, you may feel very guilty about your perverse tendencies of dressing up in women's clothes. So these are all situations where the social system makes people feel guilty while they haven't harmed anybody. So it's kind of an abuse of the emotion of guilt. What's even worse is that some social systems make people feel guilty for not even doing anything. Like in the original sin, according to Christianity and Judaism, Adam and Eve, a very long time ago, committed this original sin by eating the apple of the tree of knowledge. And now we all should feel guilty for that. Islam too. Ah, in Islam too, yeah. So now all, we should all feel guilty for that. And why is it useful for the social system to make people feel guilty? Because guilty people want to redeem themselves. That means they want to buy themselves back. They want to do things. And a classical example in Catholicism was that in the old days, in the Middle Ages, if you had committed a sin, you would first go to the priest to confess it, and then the priest could forgive you. But then he would typically ask you to do something more. Nowadays, they would just ask you to uh, pray a lot or maybe to go to, uh, to roots. Uh, but in those days, they would ask you to actually pay a substantial sum to the to the, to the church, it was called an indulgence. And then if you were a rich person and you paid a very big amount to the Pope, then the Pope would write a letter saying that God had forgiven your sins. So it's a very nice way of exploiting this uh, guilt feeling. Now we come to another uh, emotion that, in this case it's an emotion where it's almost completely <coughs> created by the social system. There probably are some biological roots of the embarrassment, but the shame is something that only functions, in a sense, in a social system. I don't think if you would live on your own, you would ever feel ashamed. So, look at the position of that woman. She's looking down, she's making herself small, she's trying not to be seen, the fingers are pointing out that she has done something wrong. So she feels kind of like the social system is condemning her for some deficiency, some shortcoming. And she would like, most of all, to sink into the earth, to disappear altogether. That is typical of shame. While with guilt, you feel kind of activated, you want to do something. With shame, you really want to disappear. So what is shame? Shame is that you perceive yourself to have some fundamental shortcoming, some fundamental deficiency. You typically, when you feel ashamed, you feel weak, you feel vulnerable, you feel small, physically small, as I say, you want to sink into the earth, you want to hide or to disappear. And why do you feel like that? Because you're not fulfilling the norms of the social systems. The social system expects you to have certain characteristics and you don't have them. For example, you're ugly, or you're homosexual, or as a woman, you're 30 years old and you're not yet married, or you are married and you don't have children yet. All of these are situations where the social system will judge that you are not fulfilling the norms. 
you're not supposed to be gay, you're not supposed to be unmarried at the age of 30, you're not supposed not to have children. So all these people will feel ashamed. They will feel that there is something wrong with them. And what is that shame? We can see it as an internalization of the negative judgment of others. So the others represent the social systems. The others will say, you should work hard in order to make money, you should look good, you should have nice clothes, you should have a nice car, you should have a husband, you should have many children, uh, you should have a job. If you don't have a job, you're unemployed. If you don't have a nice house, if you don't have a husband, etc., you will feel ashamed because you will feel as if these others are pointing at you and say, look there, that, uh, that stupid guy, he can't even keep a job, he's too lazy. Uh, look at that woman, she's too ugly to get married, she's, or, or she has a bad character, or she doesn't want to do what her husband wants, and that's why nobody wants her. So, it's, it's you feel as if your shortcomings are exposed to the social system, but you can feel ashamed without anybody actually being there. So, lots of authors, like the philosopher Sartre, define shame in terms of the others. It's when you feel the gaze of the others upon you and judging you, then you feel ashamed. But actually the shame has been internalized so that people will feel ashamed even when there's nobody there to tell them that they are uh, wrong. But they may at a certain moment, let's say, make a silly mistake and then instead of what guilt would be saying, I have made a mistake, I need to correct it, they will conclude, I'm stupid, I can't do anything, I'm no good, I should better disappear from this earth. So, I thought that was a nice illustration of shame. The guy is sitting alone, making himself small and invisible, but still it's as if he feels the whole society that's actually pointing at him and his shortcomings. So, this is kind of the <laughs> invisible hand of the social system that is reminding him how deficient he is. Uh, now, shame and guilt are often confused, and especially lots of people tend to say of themselves, I feel guilty when actually they feel ashamed. And that's probably in part because guilt is a simpler, cleaner emotion that's kind of easier to speak about. Shame is a kind of emotion people really don't want to speak about. It's a kind of emotion that really you don't want to be seen, you don't want to be reminded of, it's something to be hidden. While guilt is kind of acceptable, kind of, yeah, okay, you did something wrong, uh, yeah, you, you, you can repair for it. So guilt is more acceptable, which is one of the reasons why people often tend to say they feel guilt when actually they feel ashamed. So what is the difference? Guilt is caused by an action. You did something that's wrong. That action that happened at a particular moment, it's something temporary. It did something particular, so it's specific. And it was an action that you were in control of. You did something that you should not have done. So you were able not to do it, but you did it. If you did something that was wrong, and you were, you were in control, that's when you feel guilty. But because it is something temporary, specific and controllable, you still have control to undo it. In most cases, you can do something to compensate for the wrong deed, so you can redeem it. On the other hand, shame is the idea not that you did something wrong, but that you are something wrong. Shame is the feeling that there is something fundamentally wrong with you. That means it's a feeling that's permanent, it's general, and it's uncontrollable. You can't change yourself. If you're ugly, you can't make yourself beautiful. If you are not having children at the age of 40, there isn't anything you can really do about it. So, what can you do if you feel ashamed? You can submit to the social system. Submit means make yourself small, make yourself humble, meek, conform neatly to everything the social system says, and not be in any way attack the attention. So, 
as an origin model for the emotion of shame, I think we can look at the emotion of embarrassment. Embarrassment is a natural emotion that is easily recognizable. If somebody is in the middle of the attention and does something that may be interpreted badly, that person will feel embarrassed. But embarrassment is a temporary emotion, it's a specific emotion, it's controllable, it's more like gold, it's something like you feel embarrassed at the moment but then it disappears. But if you now internalize that and you think about yourself, I have this shameful shortcoming and if people would know about it, they would be embarrassed. And then you internalize it so that it becomes general and controlled and uncontrollable and permanent. That's when you create shame. And that feeling of shame, of course, it's really bad. I'm more and more convinced that most of the like, at least a very large part of the psychological problems we see are this are caused by shame. And so research shows that it leads to depression, anxiety, suicide, anger, violence, addiction, school dropouts, even psychosis. It's really bad. Guilt can have some of the same effects if there is a simple way to redeem your guilt. Like for example, uh, the, these sins, like suppose you're very deeply religious, but at a certain moment, let's say something bad happened and you're told, how could God let this happen? Maybe God doesn't exist. And then afterwards, you start thinking again, I shouldn't have thought that you feel very guilty because you have thought that and you can't undo that thought. Then too there are cases where people may become suicidal because of guilt. But uh, depression and suicide are more likely to be the effect of shame. Last of my emotions is disgust. So disgust, like fear, is in itself very simple. It's a biologically programmed emotion. It is a very simple function that is that you want to avoid sources of pollution. The source of pollution I mean things like parasites, microbes, poisons, things that if you ingest them might kill you. So the point of being disgusted is that you want to get <coughs> away from something that may infect you or that may poison you. So, poisoning or infecting you means that something breaches the boundaries of your body. It's outside of you, it gets inside of you, and it kills you from the inside. You get infected by uh, a virus, you swallow something that's poisonous, you get a parasite that starts drilling holes into your body. All of these are things that you feel disgusted about. So, what are the things that you typically make people disgusted? Things that come out of the body or that might get into the body and that have this possibility they are likely to contain parasites, toxins, viruses, bacteria. For example, vomit is one of the worst ones because vomit, if you vomit food out, it means that there is something bad in the food. It means that there is poison or either you're ill or there is poison in the food so you really don't want to eat anybody's vomit it's kind of the most disgusting thing you can imagine <laughs> excrements are not much better rotting meat, especially meat in which there are kind of worms crawling you definitely don't want to eat them corpses, dead bodies <laughs> Well, the worst, the worst is still to come because I'll, I'll show some photos of them. <laughs> These are the kind of things to which we have a natural revulsion. But now, what's interesting is that there is something which in magic is called a law of contagion, but actually it's not that magical, it kind of makes sense, that is it? Microbes and parasites are easily passed on from one thing to another. That's why if you would, for example, touch an excrement or a corpse, it's quite likely that some of the bacteria or that corpse would stay on your finger and then later you do this, they get into your body and you may get killed. So, 
it's part of our psychology of our disgusts that we very easily transfer disgust from one thing to another thing that has somehow been in contact with it, in contact or even just been associated with it. So there have been some experiments, which the result is not very surprising, but they put a sterilized cockroach in a glass of fruit juice, took out the cockroach and then asked people to drink that glass of fruit juice. Of course, nobody wanted to drink the glass of fruit juice. So the fruit juice in itself is not disgusting, the cockroaches, but because the one had been in contact with the other, the disgustingness had been transferred from the one to the other. Did they know that you were disinfected? Yeah, yeah. they know. Another case was uh, experiments. If you make a chocolate in the form of an excrement, people typically don't want to eat it. <laughs> So the fact that something is associated with something disgusting is sufficient to make it disgusting. And that now is what allows the social system to co opt that emotion, namely to use disgust to associate with things that are not insane disgusting. So what? Well, you don't have to look if you don't want to, but just to illustrate my previous Which one is your favorite one? The worst. Uh, this one that one. <laughs> so, how does a social system use these gusts? First, the social system presents itself as a pure, healthy organism. So, it's the organism metaphor, a social system is like an organism, an autopoietic system. That means something with clear boundaries. What's inside itself is good, what's outside is a priori dangerous. So, the boundaries should not be breached. Nothing from the outside should be Everything inside this clean, healthy social system. And then, what the SS does is to present anything that endangers its autopoiesis as something like a disease or a toxin. It's kind of an obvious metaphor to make. Non-conforming actions and ideas, that's to say, actions or ideas that could endanger the structure of the social system, they are potential diseases. And then the social system will create taboos. A taboo is a very strict prohibition to do certain things. It will uh, Rationalize that these taboos are there to protect the social system against these disease like things. So, for example, common taboos exist against homosexuality, against nudity, or in the case of uh, Islam or the Jewish religion, against eating pork. All of these taboos are justified by appealing to disgust. Homosexuality is disgusting, nudity is disgusting. Pork is disgusting. So there is a very simple reinforcement. You announce a taboo that says that certain things should not be done because they endanger the purity of the system. And you appeal to the emotion of disgust to reinforce that taboo. You can also apply to people, and an outsider that could be an alien, that means somebody who comes from the outside, but it could also be an internal nonconformist, a dissident. The outsiders are polluting the system. They are like a firm in parasites, and the system needs to defend itself, so it must violently get rid of these outsiders to repel them or to exterminate them. And that is, of course, the origin of a lot of horrible things that have happened to our history. Genocides, ethnic cleansings, witch hunts, exhibitions, burning of books, lynchings. You can think of plenty of examples. In each of these cases, the underlying idea was we need to protect this clean, healthy organism from those dirty outsiders that endanger it. So let me give probably the best known example. Uh, so you, you hear Hitler in an expression that's an expression of disgust, this is a standard aspect of disgust. And Hitler was somebody who was very sensitive to disgust. So 
they say it was not a coincidence that he was a vegetarian because meat is something that can easily be associated with his ghost. But this is almost a little quote called his book Mein Kampf. The Jew is a maggot in a fasting abscess hidden away inside the apparent clean and healthy body of the nation. So he uses exactly this metaphor of the nation, in this case the German nation, as a clean and healthy organism, a social system. The Jew is this parasite who is in this fasting abscess, a fasting abscess that means uh, uh, a place where the meat is starting to get rotten and infected, so it's very disgusting, kind of the idea of the maggot in this rotting meat. And that's what, how he saw the Jews, not only the Jews, but quite a lot of other people, as well, but particularly the Jews. And I even found a picture from the propaganda that the Jews are represented as maggots, as worms that are trying to. Uh, eat the, 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 the world. So, the last part uh, of my talk will try to get a little bit of understanding of how come that the social system can mobilize this emotion so well. Why are we so vulnerable to be manipulated in this way by these emotions? And then I start from an observation that I had a long time ago. Uh, Abraham Maslow is the psychologist who is most famous for his hierarchy of needs, but also for his study of self-actualizing people. So self-actualizing people I defined in the beginning as people who freely develop their own potentialities and are not limited by all these restrictive rules of the social system. And what Maslow did is he observed self-actualizing people and noted all the peculiarities and one of the things he noted was that they were relatively immune to fear, guilt, shame and disgust and a couple of other negative emotions. So obviously some people are more sensitive to that than others. So what makes that the non-self-actualizing people are so sensitive to these negative emotions? So now I will go to three causes of this sensitivity. Uh, insecure attachment, self-uncertainty and uh, jostling for status. So first, secure attachment. This is a theory also in psychology, which is related to the theory of Maslow. It sort of starts from a little bit of different uh, point of view, but it's nicely complementary. So Maslow said that people are self-actualized if their needs have been fulfilled, if their basic needs have been fulfilled. But he didn't exactly say when these needs should be fulfilled. The theory of secure attachment goes back to the earliest childhood and says that babies, infants, initially they are completely dependent on their caregiver, typically the mother. In theory, the, the, it could be the father or somebody else who takes care of the child. So, this infant is completely dependent on its needs for the mother, so how the mother fulfills its needs will make a very big, have a very big influence on the child. Let's assume the good case, the case that is called secure attachment, the caregiver gives sensitively and dependently to the infant's need. That means whenever the child needs something, it needs food, or it needs warmth, or it needs company, or it needs stimulation, the caregiver will give it immediately and exactly as the child wants. For example, if the child is hungry, it will not give a toy to the child, or if the child is bored, it will try to feed it sensitively and immediately. On the other hand, the caregiver is always available to help the child, but it doesn't impose on the child what it should do. It should not kind of push the child to eat or eat or want to eat. No, the caregiver should basically make the child to be as open as possible so that it can explore independently. And what you see then is that as the child goes older, it becomes less and less dependent on the caregiver. And for example, a toddler that can already walk a little bit will typically stay close to the mother 
then walk a little bit away, maybe play with a, with a, with a toy or with a cat, and then maybe the cat does up the stage and the child gets a fate and it sends back to the mother. And the mother is there uh, to take it and the child feels again safe and then it's, it's thought that it may go again to the cat. So that's what's called a secure use. The mother or the caregiver acts as a secure use. The child explores independently, but whenever it feels that it can't deal with the situation of the it has its own security faith, it comes back to the secure base and it knows that the secure base is there. So, so. The child feels confident and that can deal with whatever problem he is. And the old age, the, the father, when it gets from the secure base, but yet it no longer no longer the secure base and it's completely independent and it can pick up on its own. It becomes a secure, confident adult. That means an adult who is not afraid to think for himself or to question questions. Oh, what's the opposite situation of insecure attachment? When you get insecure at the attachment, the caregiver is not available always, always while is in need. And the most classical example is that a baby is sleeping in a suburb hood, and the baby is crying, and the parents ignore the crying. Because maybe they have heard about some verbalization some that we should condition patients when they cry, and that you condition. Ignoring the guy, and if you ignore them long enough, they will stop crying. But that's completely unnatural. I would say devastating thing, maybe, because if babies cry, they cry for a reason. So if babies cry and nobody comes, it gives the signal to the baby I'm living here in a very unsafe, insecure environment, and I can't just anything. Can give us who's, who's harsh, harsh, who are independently or inconsistently busy with each other. But in some moments they may be very loving, loving, and give lots of things to the child. And at other moments they may ignore the child or do something that the child, the child wants. They're more reasoning in their own terms than in the child's terms. So, what you get then, then is child that. It cannot trust us that it will be satisfied. It feels incompetent to satisfy its fights. Because whenever it has a need, sometimes it gets what it needs, sometimes it doesn't. It can't rely, rely on it. The world is its existence. And the only thing it can do is try to stay as close as possible to the care again, just to hope that the care given will give it the care that it needs. It's, it's not able to, to uh, explore the world on its own, so it becomes fully dependent on the larger social system. Now, this is a concept I have discovered recently. It's a kind of a general generalization of this concept of insecure attachments. What I'm telling you is to develop a theory of opposite of self actualization. Self so actualization, in my own, own concentration, I have actually totally covered this. Further work on the concept and further on the concept. In my paper, on actualization, I define it as the perceived competence to set to set my own needs. Securely, purely at the house, has a perceived competence to satisfy its needs. But that's only how it appears. Now, the child gets adult, adult, there is no a mother or a caregiver. And then it depends on the larger circumstances whether that's. Older child or young adult, adult capable to satisfy its needs. Um, it can be that it's in a situation where it simply comes out. It lives in a ghetto, it lives, it lives in a war, it lives in a war, war so it's, 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 if it belongs to a that is heavily, heavily discriminated against, if the economic crisis and, and uh, nobody has a job, and uh, you, can, you can do with a job, can lose a job, and job at any When it's in a situ situation where things change, things are very complex, complex, very people like, like or for most of the other days, then, then the child, child or the adult develop a feeling, feeling of uncertainty. Certainty, and just, just, about that situation, situation, certainty, certainty, about 
of non-Muslims and are attacked to far-right movements or, for example, to people like Trump, who offer simple solutions for complex problems. The more uncertain you are about your own situation, the more you seek that certainty in a social system that gives you simple solutions and simple rules. There is a last mechanism that social systems have used to make people more vulnerable or more sensitive to these controlling emotions and that is status hierarchies. Now humans, like other social creatures such as chimpanzees or baboons or wolves, have a tendency to establish what's called pecking orders or status hierarchies. That means that the different individuals in the group kind of will order themselves from the strongest or the most dominant to the weakest or the most submissive. And the idea is that if somebody is higher in the hierarchy than somebody else, the higher one will behave dominantly towards the lower one, the lower one will behave submissively towards the higher one. Dominantly means that whenever there are resources or opportunities, the dominant one gets them first, the submissive one will get whatever's left. Now, one aside that I haven't put on the slide is that, surprisingly, this hierarchy does not exist in hunter-gatherer societies. So if we go back to prehistory, when people lived in small bands of, let's say, about 30 hunter-gatherers, that these hunter-gatherers were very egalitarian. They didn't have bosses, they didn't have rules, there wasn't a system to coerce them, to force them to do certain things. They would discuss and hopefully agree. And in the worst case, if they disagreed, they would just walk out and they would maybe join another band or they would split the band. But they wouldn't have these general rules and they wouldn't have bosses that can impose rules. And if some guy became too bossy and started to impose things on other and behave too dominantly, then the whole group would conspire against this guy and make sure that nobody listens to him anymore or in the worst case they would expel him or in the very worst case they would even kill him. So if a guy becomes a bully and tries to dominate others by physical force, the others would conspire against him and make sure that he could no longer do that. So in hunter-gatherer societies this hierarchy doesn't exist. So why does this hierarchy exist now? I think it is because of social systems, because we see the rise of these hierarchies in agricultural civilizations. And in our paper we have suggested that the 
rise of the social systems is with the transition from hunter-gatherer bands where there are no formal rules, where everything is discussed and agreed upon just informally, face-to-face -face contact, to agricultural civilizations where now you get a whole system of rules with taboos and prescriptions and uh, different levels and costs, and then this may, let's say, this old ancient Egypt, this may be the farmers, and this may be the priests, and this may be the pharaoh, and the pharaoh has practically absolute power, he can order anybody to be killed, or he can order people to build a pyramid that probably would cost the equivalent of the whole income of the whole, uh, of the whole empire just for one tomb for one person. So, what you see is that you get a very unequal division of resources. So the higher up in the hierarchy, the more power, the more resources. Why would that help social systems? Because social systems are systems of rules that try to perpetuate themselves. If you have a hierarchy, the one at the top has very good reason to enforce the rules because the rules are the ones that define his position as the top. If he is a pharaoh, it's because there is a whole system of rules that says that you should behave to pharaohs in this and this way, and you should behave to priests in this and this way, and you should behave to farmers in this and this way. And so it's in the, to the benefit of the pharaoh to enforce these rules, and the pharaoh has the power to enforce these rules. Now these rules for the farmers are maybe not so nice, but the farmers are too weak to challenge these rules, so, and moreover, these farmers at the bottom, they're in a very uncertain situation. So they are in a situation that I called before self-uncertainty. So they are also not going to dare to challenge the rules. And in the rare cases where the weaker ones <coughs> would be able to challenge the top and you would have some kind of revolution, what would happen is just that the ones that take power become the new elite and they would just themselves be put themselves at the top of the hierarchy and the system would remain the same. There would be new people at the top, but it would be the same system. Do you know what's interesting about <coughs> that this pecking order is some, uh, like um, a pattern from nature, but it wasn't in that particular species, but social systems managed to like to take the pattern and impose it on another species, which didn't have it. <laughs> well, that's the question whether it existed in our species or not, since uh, gorillas and chimpanzees seem to have it, which are our closest relatives, and we still have that instinct. Mm -hmm. Probably it exists in our species, but the hunter-gatherers have somehow found a way to mitigate it. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they still need from time to time to, time yeah. to expel these bullies shows that it hasn't disappeared from our biological instincts. But the, the social system doesn't have reignited that so, and made it much stronger. Like epigenetics, like, like uh, yeah. different yeah. circumstances, different tendencies. Yeah, you might say so. The hunter gatherers at that point, in the, in the late point, there was specialization, right? So there were some people who would be better scouts, better. Well, there is of course a, a general transition from uh, small band hunter gatherers to larger bands to settled hunter gatherers, and then the more you go to work agriculture, the more you will have this division of labor, and the more you will already have some degree of hierarchy. But apparently, this, this egalitarian it continued well beyond uh, hunter gatherers in the sense that there are many small societies where they have similar kind of mechanisms. Uh, where um, I just had a paper about it where the, the, the expression they like to use is that they have a leader, but the leader is one among equals. So the leader is somebody they listen to because he's a bit more experienced and a bit wiser. But if he really would start to say, uh, you give me uh, your food because I'm the boss, then they would, they would not accept that. Uh, now I want to come to a kind of a synthesis of the different control mechanisms I saw, and so these were the four emotions, the negative emotions I discussed. Fear, guilt, shame, disgust. And also anthropologists have suggested that different cultures 
rely on different mechanisms. I think they all refer on all four mechanisms, but some emphasize one more than the other. And there's a famous work of the anthropologist Ruth Benedict, in which he describes Japanese culture and contrasts it with American culture, and that's the origin of the idea that there are guilt-based cultures like the Western ones, and shame-based cultures like the Asian ones. The idea that with, in Western cultures, people tend to be held individually responsible for things they have done, while in Asian ones there's more kind of a collectivistic view and people should not deviate from the norms. But then others have said that in Africa at the moment and probably also in Latin America there's much more of fear-based culture in the sense that the ones in power, they really make clear that if anybody dares to challenge the rule, they will not survive it. So it's maybe a more rough way, but it's the other one. And then for the disgust, the Nazism was clearly based on disgust, and probably there are some other cultures that are based on disgust. I'm not enough of an anthropologist to say where disgust might be the strongest, but it's clearly, it clearly plays a role in lots of cultures. Uh, but you see that I have put guilt with pride each time I have connected a negative emotion with a positive emotion. But let me first say more about this, uh, what I call the quadrangle. The idea came from another guy who had just looked at those three and who had made a triangle of them. But because the disgust was clearly having an important role, I added it and made a quadrangle of it. And the quadrangle is such that you see, fear and guilt are related, disgust and fear are related. It's like that. Why is that? Fear and guilt, because fear is, and guilt is to some degree a fear of retribution, so they overlap. Shame and guilt are often confused, because if somebody did something bad, maybe it is because he is bad, or maybe he is bad because he did something bad. People often confuse between the two. Shame and disgust are related because both start from some kind of an ideal defined by the social system. And if you don't fit into the ideal, then either you're an object of shame or you're an object of disgust. And disgust and fear are related because disgust and fear are biological instincts that try to uh, protect us from harm. So, and then there is this overlap, of course, because it's not always clear to say whether this emotion is really guilt or shame. Or maybe there's even a little bit of an element of fear or disgust in it. That's why I described it with circles. Uh, no, yeah. <laughs> Apparently, your computer doesn't form a thing in the same way as mine. Uh, so, I can now bring into contact the emotions and the status hierarchies, and generally, the negative emotions, they point at a low status, let's say at humiliation, being dominated, being submissive. The positive complements of these emotions are rather pointers to high status. So actually you should read each time two of those together, that's where the lines were supposed to be. So fear goes together with power, because fear means that uh, you're afraid of those who can punish you, that means those who have power. Well, power means you have the power to punish others, you don't need to be afraid. Guilt means that you have done something bad so that you are considered as a criminal or a, a sinner, that means you get a low status because you have done something wrong, while pride means you have done something good, you have done something better than usual, so you looked at highly, for example, you could be an Olympic winner of a medal, you have reason to be proud, but if then they find out that actually you took some forbidden drugs to enhance your performance, then suddenly from being proud you become guilty because actually your good performance was not really done the way it should be according to the rules. 
Shame means that you don't fit the norms, you're considered efficient according to the norms, while honor means that you're upholding the norms, you're an honorable citizen, you're upholding the norms, and you may be honorable in the sense that you're even better than the others, you have a high status. Purity means that you have avoided any pollution, you are exactly the way it should be, you haven't strayed anywhere from the right path. All this gust is what you get if you have, if you don't have this purity. And in social systems, we see that it's typically directed at the low status groups. And there's a particularly good name for that. In India, you have this group. It's not really a caste. It's not even a caste. It's worse than a caste. They call themselves Dalits, but they are also called untouchables. And the untouchables says enough. It means they're considered to be so dirty that other members of, of Indian gods should simply not touch them. And that means that they typically will do all the dirtiest work, like cleaning toilets and uh, uh, collecting garbage. So, again, the connection between status and these emotions. What happens if your status is being challenged? <coughs> your status will be challenged if you have some other transgressor rules. If you have done things that you should not, you're not supposed to do, you may lose your status. Now, a loss of status in the social systems, the way we know it, is very dangerous because all the resources and the power go to the ones with the high status. Losing status means that you lose all these resources and all that power. If you are suddenly at the mercy of all these others, that you may lose your income, that you may lose your house, that you may lose access to other people to marry, that you may no longer be able to reproduce because of that. So loss of status in a dominance hierarchy is very dangerous, both psychologically and biologically, because biologically going down in status that typically means you don't reproduce yourself, your genes are eliminated from the gene pool. So that means if your status is being challenged by somebody, that's a very dangerous situation, and so people are inclined to act very violently. So one way to do it, if somebody else challenges you and says, you're a dirty scoundrel, you have fucked my wife, that's a challenge to your status then one way is to attack the challenger, for example, say, I don't take this offense, I challenge you to a duel and we'll see who survives. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> There's some cultural mismatch in this scene, like with the language. <laughs> <But okay. laughs> uh, well, the, <laughs> this, is a, this is something that has also been called by some psychologists the culture of honor. And they describe it especially in the American South. The American South is much more violent, also much more gun violence than in the North. And it's in part because they have this culture like that you need to defend your honor. And if somebody else, for whatever reason, challenges your honor, you typically react very violently. And they don't do duels anymore, literally but then you still start to fight. Mm. If somebody tells something unpleasant to you somewhere in a, in, a, in a pub, you hit him on the face rather than just politely uh, trying to calm things down. So there is a culture of violence that goes together with this culture of honor. Another possibility is that if somebody transgresses the rules and it's somebody of your community, you attack the person who transgressed the rules because you want to defend your community from loss of status and that's why you get typically honor killing. So what's a typical honor killing that might be a father or a brother that kills his daughter or his sister because, for example, she ran away from an age marriage. Things like that regularly come in the news. Typically, people from Afghanistan or Pakistan, when the father discusses with some other family and gives his daughter in marriage to some other guy, 
it's kind of like an honor, it's kind of an honorable agreement, and if then the daughter runs away from that, it's very bad for the reputation of the family. And the reaction can sometimes mean that they actually kill the daughter. So that's really horrible, but it's the logic of this kind of system. And the final uh, possibility is if somebody transgresses the rule and like that incurs this loss of status, is that the perpetrator himself should do something drastic to redeem himself. And in Japan, the typical solution is harakiri. You have done something that has brought shame over yourself, so you commit suicide. But interestingly, I read an article that the suicide bombers that are recruited by IS and similar terrorist groups, that these are often people who are pretty much ashamed of themselves. They, for example, were petty criminals or alcoholics or school dropouts. And neither their parents nor the society around them sees them as having any kind of a value. So it's a way for them to redeem themselves by offering, by sacrificing their own life to this bigger cause. The bigger cause than being the survival of the social system, which in this case, for example, is Islamic State. It's for them a way to redeem themselves from their own shame. So it's a, it's a model that actually quite well explains suicide bombing. And then finally, we come to the conclusion. Now I've told you about all these negative, unpleasant aspects of social systems, which program people with a number of rules that are sometimes very harsh and not at all necessary. So. What our project, which we call SSP, Social Systems Programming, aims to do is try to remedy this problem. And that means we try to envisage how a society could function without programming. That means at the very least that the, the rules of the social system should not be tacitly seen as the absolute truth, but that they should be open to scrutiny and change and change, that people should become aware that these are just conventional rules, that this is not the word of God, and that it's not an absolute shame that you would ever dare to question this thing, but that these are social constructions that should be, that should be discussed and that may have to be changed. So people should be made aware of the fact that they have to be conditioned to accept these rules without thinking, but that actually they should be free to undo that conditioning and not accept these programs and to develop their own personality. In particular, we would like these rules not to be enforced by negative emotions like fear, guilt, shame or disgust, all of which have proven in history to be really, have quite horrible effects. I mean, the genocides, uh, are the most spectacular example, but there are plenty of examples of abuse of these emotions for really horrible purposes. So, what we would like instead is that education socialization should rather promote secure attachment and self certainty so that people get the self confidence, the maturity to make their own decisions. And research has shown that. That kind of education indeed leads to mature, moral, happy, self-actualized <coughs> individuals. It's not like conservative and religious thinkers often say, yeah, but without fear or without disgust or without shame or guilt, people would behave shamelessly, they would be immoral, they would all be criminals, they would, if they're not afraid of God or they're not afraid of capital punishment or they don't feel guilty, they would start drinking and murdering and raping and all these things. That simply is not correct. If you look at the statistics for murders, rapes, teenage pregnancies, drug addiction, and so you typically find that they are strongest in the regions where these social systems rules are most harsh. The more liberal countries is where you have least of these problems. So 
clear that it's not all these strict rules and these strict honor and shame and guilt and disgust systems that are protecting people from crime or from immoral behavior. So, the different approach, the approach which is not based on obedience to formal rules, to blind obedience, but to individual thinking, freedom, uh, dependable care is the right way to go. And finally, our long-term aim is what we call, that's the term of Martha, is what we call a human takeover, in which instead of humans being controlled by the social systems, humans would take over the social systems and humans would control the social systems. That means that instead of being at the mercy of the existing social systems, we would ourselves rationally think about to design better social systems. But that's of course not a trivial thing, that's why we need theories, we need methods, we need very deep thinking of which this project is part of it, so that we can develop strategies to intervene in existing social systems and make them better and make them more the way that they indeed promote human well-being rather than their own uh, survival. So the idea is that it's no longer the social system that controls us for their own perpetuation, but us controlling them in order to optimize our own well-being. So what we really want is that the social system we cannot do without it. It is an autopoietic entity. It has self-organized. It has a system of rules. That these social systems would no longer <coughs> play the role of a parasite, but really what is called in biology a mutualist means one that gives us as much benefit as we give it benefits. So that's the long-term aim of our project, and uh, we have at the moment at least half a dozen other papers in preparation to uh, work on this aim. So this talk actually is a summary of two papers which you can find on the web. Uh, in the abstract, it was the, the links were given, <coughs> and we have at least three draft papers or four draft papers that will go further on the, in this direction. Okay, so if there are questions. So, I mean, we are, we haven't yet reached a point where humans can be self sufficient. I don't know if they ever can be, that's a discussion. But um, since we are, um, since we can't be self-sufficient, we need some kind of group to provide for our needs, whether they be emotional, physical, whatever. Um, and so how would you, in a, in a society like the one today, where, let's say, uh, the colour of your skin or your sexuality will ever from childhood when you're in school, uh, taught by teachers and so on, or just even when you're an adult reading the news and so on, the way that your skin colour, the way that your sexuality is portrayed makes you feel inherently um, like unvalued, you have a shame for just being dark, um, and so on. Um, I wonder how you think we could navigate from a, from a point um, from a point like the one today in order to progress, because these individuals, because ever since they were kids, they've been taught that they should be inherently ashamed of who they are and, and who they want to become, and they still need the social uh, ties they have in order to survive. How do you think we could progress, you know, like if, if, if the current generations have this self-image, how do you think we could organically grow into a society like this? Um, yes, well, we have been thinking about two strategies. There is the individual strategy and there is a social <coughs> strategy. The individual strategy would be to make people like that aware of the way they have been conditioned. That means freeing them, releasing them from these feelings of shame like giving them the message, you can do things on your own, you don't have to be like the others, you don't have to believe that you are deficient because you are black or a woman or gay or whatever. And there are a number of techniques in that. Psychotherapy can help, uh, reading certain books can help, uh, maybe even psychedelics can help, uh, mindfulness can help. There are a number of techniques to make people more aware and more self-confident. So that, that was one of the papers we were planning to have a kind of an overview of these kind of techniques. 
But then there is also on the social level, it's yeah, it's it still demands quite some strength of character to start applying these things to yourself. Uh, on the social level, one of the things I think may be most effective is uh, role models. Uh, if you have a role model of somebody of this category, which is supposed to be inferior or feel ashamed of it or itself, and that role model is very successful and is clearly uh, publicized, then people will say, ah, oh, but she can be a, a world famous mathematician or he can be the president of the US, then maybe I can also do that. Mm, but, but I think a lot of people, at least that I know, um, that have faced a lot of racism, uh, for example, they are very aware of it, and, but they are also aware that the people that are presented as role models, right, as like, you know, Obama was the president, or, you know, uh, they are um, people that have had to change their cultural identity conform to social rules, you know, like for example, um, yesterday I was having a coffee with a friend of mine uh, and he's black and we were talking about how to present yourselves and both of our parents have kind of, since we were children, taught us, you know, you have to dress well because if you don't then, you know, people will look at you badly. And he was talking about um, how um, he was in uni, he was wearing a hoodie, as soon as he stepped out of um, uni, he was dressed slightly urban, the police came to ask him questions, you know. Uh, and I had the same in, in, in the, in the um, uh, when I was going through security in the airport, uh, I was wearing a hoodie and slacks and suddenly, you know, they had to search me, whereas if I dressed like this, nobody cares. And, and so, um, and then the people like, let's say, Obama, or like Muslims who have positions of power, they've had to socialize and look sharper, be kinder, because they, you see what I mean? So in order for me to reach a position of power, I have to conform to the social settings and the social rules. And, and so I wonder how you mean that you could be empowered and reach a position of power without having to navigate through the social rules. Uh, it, it's a difficult, it is a difficult navigation, but um, my own preference is that in this case you have two social systems. You have, let's say, the social system where you wear a hoodie and you have the social system where you wear a tie. And I think you shouldn't be in either of those. You should be yourself, which means that you should be I don't know, the way most of us are dressed, not in any particular, uh, not in a way that immediately identifies us with a particular group. So I think identifying yourself with a particular group, if that particular group has certain, there are certain negative expectations about that group, you can say, yeah, if I am proud of being a member of that group. But on the other hand, you want to be treated like a member of the other group. I think you should think of yourself as an individual, first of all, and try to be not visibly a member of any particular group. That's one way to kind of... But I know it's... it's, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's I, I, I think the, 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 the idea is carried by this uh, very belief system. So many people believe that it is in a certain way, so they act in a certain way based on the rules given by the social system. And, and so you feel that, or your friends may feel that, you know, the way you are treated. So it needs to be, the, the, the social system itself that needs to be changed. You can't change the individual piece, in my opinion. It's like, it's like if you compare it to the Roman Catholic Church, the religion, then it would be like, we don't like uh, celibacy anymore. Part of the church, we don't like it, we take it out, then what happens to the Roman Catholic Church? Mm -hmm. So you need to replace it with something else, because otherwise, as Francis said, it's not, you will disturb or damage the autopoietic system mm -hmm. and will resist that. So you, I think you can't just delete it, that kind of behavior or teach it in another way. It needs to change the belief system. Yeah, but I think that's an interesting point, uh, because how much of this is also... I mean, you're always talking about changing it and better education and uh, other interventions, but how much can we change it? How much is, for example, genetically and epigenetically defined? I take, for example, we humans have an inclination, a, a programmed, a genetic programmed inclination to be very... Uh, to be uh, religious uh, uh, or... 
we have some inclination to to become religious. Let me say it like that way. No, no, uh, I, I don't or, believe or it. Take morality, perhaps uh, very briefly, because a lot of what you said boils down to morality, eh? and, and morality is also something very strongly programmed. And we we don't see how strongly it's programmed because we are so fine tuned to it. It's like white people, uh, they can recognize all kinds of different white people, but for another color it's a bit more difficult because we are more attuned to the differences, but we don't see the iceberg under the surface, which is morality is very much uh, programmed genetically as a species, uh, and uh, we are fine-tuned to the little differences, and we, uh, we, uh, think, we think big differences, but we don't see how important, in fact, it is uh, so the result of, of talk about changing, but how far can we go? Like, like for example, about morality. Um, we, our morality is not well developed. Uh, it can be much better. Uh, for example, our morality is developed or programmed because we live in tribes. So we care a lot about uh, morality in people in our vicinity, in our inner circle. And they did some uh, very interesting experiments about that. For example, there was an experiment uh, where they asked people, uh, if you see a child uh, in the street and it's bleeding and it's wounded, uh, uh, will you help it? Uh, and uh, stop your car and bring the, uh, the child to the hospital. Uh, and uh, of course, all the, and it will damage the, the leather wear of your car and it will cost you $200 uh, because it will be blooded. That was an experiment. And of course, people, most people will say, of course I will take the child and pay the 200 uh, euros to repair my leather in my car. And then they are the same thing, but, but what about the child in Africa dying in the dirt? Most if you come along to ask some money on the day, you, uh, nobody will even give five euros uh, because it's our morality is uh, trained to work uh, in our close in the vicinity for our tribe uh, people uh, and people on the other side of, of the world we don't care about, about it so uh, if, if our morality was better developed we should be even <coughs> care as much of a child in Africa as a child uh, we see bleeding next uh, to the road in fact so this is one of the many examples showing how our morality is not very well created in fact uh, and we can of course uh, do a lot with education but I think a lot of things are uh, also a bit uh, ingrained in, in, our, in the way our brain works in fact uh, programmed by whom? by evolution by no, natural no, selection no, what I'm saying is that we have a number of programs in our brain but they can be co-opted <coughs> by the social system that means they can be directed to different things and with this gust it's most easy to see there are these categories like excrements and corpses that would any illicit disgust in anybody, but then you can associate these categories with other things that don't at all fit in these categories, like Negroes or, or, or Jews or homosexuals or women, and associations are learned things, but it's a mechanism that allows these associations to be made very quickly. If you make different associations, you get a totally different uh, social system, and the same with morality. Morality, there are certain basic instincts, like for example, I suggested that the emotional guilt is basically based on fairness, that we have the feeling that if we treat people badly, they will treat us badly, and they have the right to treat us badly, there's a kind of a fairness criteria. But then it depends on what you define as treating people badly, and that's why the social system then can say, uh, if you kick a beggar in the street, it's no problem, but if you uh, say something wrong to your boss, it's a horrible offense. Mm -hmm. uh, so the mechanisms are there, mm -hmm. the programs are there, but the way they are implemented and the way they use them depends very much on the social system, and there you can steer, you can change the association. The problem is that they are there, uh, and that's a big problem, I think. It's very, uh, people have this natural inclination to become, to, uh, to become religious, uh, so therefore people will, they often say, you have to give science and religion uh, equal amounts, but if you do that, uh, people, most people will go to the religion aspect. No, I don't is, believe that. I don't believe that. The, the uncertainty identity theory actually explains that people will be more religious the more uncertain. But he has, has a point in the sense that religion mostly talks to the subconscious or unconscious emotional part of our, of, of our system, while science will talk to the rational cold, uh, which is. And then this interface is what creates the social systems also, right? Yeah. Because they are based on, on, on 
primitive uh, fear, emotions, and all that. They use them, but the, uh, I think the optimistic, they use them. the optimistic point, what I try to explain with Maslow and secure attachment, is that the more secure you are, and that depends really on early education, the less you have the need to feel, find the certainty in religion. Yeah. And I happen to have had a very secure education, and I've never been in the least attacked by religion. But then as well, I think it's something depending, there's some security which you, you can't have. Um, so you were talking about uh, um, being a person and choosing not to identify with any group, not having any visual, but there are some things like, you know, being born black, you can't unchoose it and you will be linked to a certain group directly, right? Or if you look Arab, and now with an increasing yeah, Islamophobia, um, it's very hard to look Arab, how, remotely how Arab. Huh? How does an Arab look? How does, oh, that's a good question. Uh, um, I would like to say as a person, but uh, but a lot of... Um, so, uh, with the question, how does an Arab look? Um, they can look like anything from the Maghreb to, to a Persian. Persian born Arab, technically, but uh, <laughs> Afghanis. Um, and right, and they can look in all kinds of different ways. Um, uh, but there's in, for example, in Belgium, what a lot of people say an Arab looks like is people from North Africa, because those are the Arabs in Belgium right now. So the term Arab, I mean, but anyways, what, what I was actually getting to um, was was the fact that, um, oh, no, I've lost my point. Uh, what does an Arab sure. uh, um, That you oh, can't yes, change the way you look. Uh, that, and, and I think, um, if you live in a society that, uh, where, for example, uh, you know, the way you look ostracizes you, um, then it's quite natural that people need some comfort in some other institution. And whether that is in an extremist, uh, an extremist political, political group or an extremist religious group, you know, people need to feel like they belong somewhere. And, and so, so how, if, if, if we do live in a society where some, a lot of people feel like they don't belong because of who they are, how they were born, like, how, how could we give them that safety? Because people need safety at a certain point. And if they can't be accepted by society, what's, what, how do you think we could replace those negative social groups with positive social groups? Well, yeah, I think that you said it yourself. You, it's good to have social groups that give these people an identity, but this should be positive social good. But the problem is then that they need to have certain social rules, which, and that's the research, which we need to formulate in a way that we are sure that they are positive. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, this, uh, this is a talk about like replacing bad programming by better programming, but still social programming. Because like, and, uh, like mm -hmm. social design and us freeing them, this is kind of you know, like a story of social progress, that there are better systems, that people feel better and nicer and so on. But like, if, if you are like, rendered in a way by a social system you, if, and you feel uh, being rendered by not, not positively and so on like you know like you you look a certain way people see you a certain way of course it uh, evokes emotions as as francis discussed that kind of you know like use like position you position others and so on but if you like propose a social process to kind of feed or like take care, whatever, like you, you phrase it, of, of this particular emotions, you are creating a new social system, which is fed by, by, like from, by other emotions. So like for me, that human takeover, it takes, like it, it, it's in a much more intimate space. Like if, if you take a social system as an entity, a kind of, you know, uh, thing that uh, is built of, communication and social action of a human, like the boundaries between the human and that human's actions and that human's interpretations and that human's feeling, like understanding of the, the feelings which are evoked by social system in that person. So like in a mi micro scale, the human takeover is like your, you're taking over like your language, not like that you, you are used by the language which you speak to produce it, but the other way around, you express, you 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 take this emotion which is uh, which is produced in you by a social system, and you don't act it out in a, like another social system pattern. Mm -hmm. I think it's Lunch. I think it's I think it's the highest level. I think it comes down to purpose. So the reason why people are kind of 
that gravitate towards these kind of these systems whereby they're a part of something is because they don't have a sense of self in regards to like what they actually are and how they can then transcend that across society. So it, so if, if people kind of if society made people double down on their strengths instead of trying to make them figure out their weaknesses, then it'd be a case of going, okay, I'm this and I can add this, versus going, I'm very, very instead of going, oh, I'm really good at this, but I'm bad at all these things, let's focus all my time and energy on making myself adequate at these. It should be more the case of people understanding what they can add in synergy to everything else. And I feel like that's that's kind of like the, and the most interesting thing, like the, an interesting word that you said for your initial question to Francis was the word that, that you said was um, it was navigate. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's what it comes down to. It's, it's more about like you understanding who you are and then what like what would be best for everyone, and then navigating towards that versus conforming. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's that, that's what mm-hmm. would be quite important. But the, uh, like I said, I think the biggest mistake we can make is to think that we can all teach it while ignoring like, the, the, the programmed uh, instincts because they are very strong. Just like the example you gave in your talk about women uh, becoming mathematicians. Uh, uh, it's great that women uh, can become mathematicians, it's of course very important, but there was also an interesting experiment where they took a group of very talented, very smart, uh, mathematically uh, prodigious women. Yeah. So they were very good in mathematics uh, and they followed them. Uh, so they were very good in mathematics at, at the end of high school, brilliant women. Uh, and this group of brilliant women, uh, they followed them and then they saw that most of the women, despite that they were very good in mathematics, they didn't choose mathematics or engineering educations. Uh, they, ju- they choose to become a medical doctor or to choose languages and so on. So uh, we cannot. Fo- it's important that they are able to choose what they but want. That is the social but system that's... programming. They are programmed, even if they are good at mathematics, to consider it as not a mat- not a, a women's job. I would say it's more just genetically no. no, I don't more think I think. to choose for languages and <laughs> when to care like a medical doctor. I mean, they become a medical doctor. Maybe they <laughs> become an engineer. No. I think just prove that it's more a little bit also genetic. <laughs> 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 there is a slight genetic difference between men and women in terms of yeah. women might be more interested in social things than men, but no, the difference is really not that big. I, I don't know. What's the genetic difference between men and women that would make us good or bad in mathematics? Can you, can you flesh it out? Yeah, that's, not, that's not what I'm saying. The women were all very good at mathematics, they were brilliant, in fact, for mathematics, but they didn't, uh, even if they were men, they probably would choose more to become an engineer, but the women did choose to become a medical doctor or to study languages. That was the goal of the experiment. And, and, and it's showing, in fact, the researchers concluded. Uh, that the women, despite that they had all the potential to be become an engineer, uh, have more uh, a natural proclivity, which we cannot ignore, to choose more for language-based things or caring uh, uh, educations. And uh, there is a huge difference between there are differences between a uh, male brain and a female brain. That's if you uh, yeah, uh, if, if you say that's not true, it's completely different. This is, this is the hypothetical. It's not hypothetical. It's biology. There is a study. And you search results, but then there is a trying to explain that, which has which is not studied, which is just thinking. No, I think the biggest mistake we can make is that the difference between man and woman is just something uh, a protocol uh, made by civilization, and it's not biologically. You have both. No, they would have they would have studied the brains of these people. But the, the fact that the fact that the ladies too have chosen not to become mathematicians, I think this is, this is brilliant. That mm-hmm. gives them the highest IQ. Yeah, indeed. Right? That's I mean, great. Who wants to yeah, become a mathematician and star rather than becoming a doctor and... No, no, I, I, mean, I think if I say what... what so um, there's one study they made, and this is children in school as well, mm-hmm. where they did, it was in America, and they let the kids do mock SATs. So SATs are, are um, universal tests, and everyone in the American schooling system should be as good as applying at it, theoretically. Um, and then they did one, they did for mathematics, you know, there's this conception that women, naturally, we aren't good at abstract reasoning, for example, mathematics or philosophy. Um, and they let the women and the men, and people of all kinds of different races, do the tests And the first time, they did it twice, right, with the same people. The first time, what they said was, you're doing this test only to evaluate if we're doing the test right. So if the test is fitted to your kind of knowledge. 
They did it. And then you found that women and men get about the same results, and it doesn't matter really what race they are. You put them in a second time, and you say, now we're going to judge you based on your results, and depending on how good your result is, um, you'll get different opportunities, right? And then they instantly be become aware of themselves as a person taking the test. What they found then was that women performed much worse than men, which performed higher. People that were black performed less good than people that were white. And in, in, in the, the conclusion from that theory was as soon as people have to position themselves socially in a social context, mm -hmm. it will either boost their self-confidence or decline their self-confidence. Mm -hmm. And I think definitely that's what happens, for example, with women that want to pursue mathematics or, or philosophy. In my case, you become very quickly aware that you're not supposed to be there. So you choose something else where you can perform well and where you can be accepted. And so I don't think it has anything to do with us naturally being worse or better at anything. In fact, that experiment showed that they were really good at maths. Yeah. It just shows that you feel like it's impossible for you to make a living in it. Do you see what I mean? Well, I wouldn't conclude that. It can be an explanation why they didn't choose uh, to become an engineer, despite that they were brilliant in mathematics. Uh, does perhaps your explanation or other explanation could be that uh, women have more uh, a tendency to be care uh, to to be social with people and to care for people and therefore like to become a medical doctor more than uh, an engineer? Well, then how do you dis how do you would you then explain that um, there are more female there are a lot of male doctors? No, it's, mostly no, female no, doctors. No, no, most Belgium doctors are men. No, 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 in Belgium most doctors are female. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, indeed. So it's exactly. quickly. Yeah. And, uh, and the same will happen with the engineers, there will be more I hope female so. engineers. Yeah, but I think less proportionally than female doctors. See, what I'm getting from you, my man, I'm getting the sense from you that you mean it in a positive way, in the sense that, like, I think what you said, I'm not saying, I'm, not, I'm, I'm trying to communicate, so <laughs> what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get the sense of is that you're talking about how people leverage their capacity mm -hmm. to add to society. Is that what you're saying? So you're saying like even if if a, if a man and a woman is equally intelligent, yep. as you're, you're saying that women generally have a better when it comes to compassion and understanding and communication. So it makes sense that they do that. Is that what you're trying to say? But yeah, but I want to try. What I want to try to say is that uh, we cannot ignore the biological differences. Mm. Uh, they are there, and it would be insane. It would be the same mistake as with socialism, like with communism. Eh? It's like uh, communism is perhaps an interesting idea, but it doesn't just work for people. And uh, why it went wrong? Because it was enforced on a species that doesn't think and is not uh, work like that. It's like uh, Wilson said, a famous uh, scientist about com communism. He said, a nice idea but wrong species. And just to say uh, that we have to take also into account our biological proclivities and tendencies uh, and just not saying that it can all be socially constructed and learned. We have to know ourselves much better how we are programmed evolutionarily by millions of years of evolution uh, and have to know also that aspect. Uh, and that makes us stronger to fight against it in fact and to, uh, to create a better civilization for everyone with equal opportunities and so on. I agree, I agree more so with you because perception is a huge part of the process. Yeah, sure. definitely. Mm -hmm. and, and when you don't have any, for example, for me, uh, having done a bachelor's in philosophy, uh, I think in all of the years I had one female lecturer and one female teacher assistant, everything else was male, then as you were talking about role models, it's very hard to imagine yourself in that field. Um, and then if these women look around themselves and they look, who is an engineer? Who is a mathematician? And all that they see is males, you don't really have that feeling that you can achieve the same thing, right? So I think you should maybe think, and, and I will think about more about whether it's natural or not, but maybe you should try to think about um, what kind of, because as a, as a um, I hate to say it, but as a, as a white male, uh, you, you do, you have the luxury to be oblivious to certain social rules that infringe on the freedom of others. And so maybe try, I'm really late already, so I need to leave right now, but, Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, but the question is, if women have the complete Bye. freedom to choose, <laughs> I think more, more women would choose to become a medical doctor than an engineer. If they had the complete freedom and no input from uh, the social system, but I think most uh, more that's, women... That's quite possible, but the question is how much would it be 90%, 10% or would it 60%, 40%? Yeah. What I think is that society 
reinforces the difference. And it's so that 90% would choose when, in reality, biologically, it might be 60%. Or they just don't care about the boring st uh, programming stuff and they just want to be more uh, socially with people. I think that's more We're important. confusing many things because male and female are biological terms. Man and woman are social terms. Uh, and, and, and also mathematics is a social term mm -hmm. because uh, the other, other kinds of mathematics have been taught now other kinds of mathematics have been taught in, in ancient Greece or in Egypt or in Babylonia mm -hmm. so mathematics per se doesn't say anything about the, the, the IQ or the capacity to adapt to problems or to problem solving or whatever it's just a, a, another uh, social construct as, as, as we, we, it's part of the social system I prefer that than social construct Part of the social system that, that teaches mathematics in this way and all that. So then you have different filters that you are imposed in this evolution that is so much like the male and female are getting man and women and woman and they're going through a social education uh, education where picks up the good mathematician or not. So I think that all these things are quite irrelevant actually. So how to construct a new Social system, and, and, and I, I love the term, I really love it. Can, can, can we copy it? Human takeover? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that, that's fantastic because it's. Yeah, it's well, just, a, uh, it's a good choice of words, yeah. You should take one. No, we have papers. You have, you have to do. The only way to do that is to train. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. And knowing thyself, I think that's very that's important. That's fantastic, yes. That's very important. Uh, a biological heritage, we can't ignore it. And, uh, so it's not but all it's socially constructible lines, like it's not no. just, oh, let's go to school and explain. Cool. Cool. We have these inclinations, these tendencies, and we have to recognize them. That's, that's the only point so, I, so for, so, I want to make. So forget yeah. about male and, and, and men and women, you ah. have male and female, and they're going to construct a, a, a human takeover. But uh, are you saying? I would like to stop the discussion of male and female because I know it can go yeah. for another. <laughs> I would like to ask some question. Ah, oh, yeah. somebody else has a question there. Yeah. Yes, yeah, something. Because um, you talked about uh, what is related a bit. If you have, if you don't obey, for instance, uh, the rule that you cannot become a magician, um, it can result in shame, guilt, self doubt, and imposter syndrome. And I was thinking. Like imposter syndrome is related to shame and guilt, perhaps. Um, and then talking about disgust, I thought of the neurosis of um, contagion fear, or I don't know what it's to call the fear of contagion. The yeah, fear, which probably goes like, together with the disgust of the. Yeah. So, have you had any thoughts on that? Uh, what could be relation with social system and rules and not, and not obeying to rules or trying to over obey to rules by resulting in the neurosis to clean up? Yeah, it's, a, it's an extremely interesting topic which I am going to research further together with Kate, uh, the, the, one of the co-authors. We are going to write a paper on uh, shame and guilt in gifted women and uh, I have I know I a lot of books on shame, and they're very complex and they're not very clear. So what I have tried to do here is kind of summarize them, but I could go much deeper. And um, so it could, yeah, there's association uh, with shame. Yeah, the, 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 I mean, one of the problems I personally have with shame is that I don't know what it is personally. I don't have it, but I see lots of people that I know very well who suffer from it. So that is why I got interested in it, because it's something I really don't understand and I see that it affects people. And from what I read, I have the feeling that it's much more widespread than most people think, precisely because it's the kind of emotion that you hide. Guilt, fear, disgust is much more visible. Shame is a kind of hidden emotion. It's a kind of an emotion where people think very badly about themselves, but they wouldn't say so to anybody else because if the others would confirm them, it would only make it worse. So, and I suspect they are even ashamed that they are ashamed. <laughs> so, uh, it is really a hidden emotion that is very tricky and the, the, the psychotherapists that work with it, they also don't have clear 
methods to deal with it. They have kind of indirect methods because you can't just tell people that your problem is shame because that will already make them feel ashamed and just make it worse. So uh, mm -hmm. the, the shame is really a kind of a feeling of inferiority or humiliation that you have the feeling that you really cannot fulfill the requirements of the social system. There is something fundamentally wrong with you and the only way to survive is to hide that. Because if people would find out your shortcomings, they would they would do all kind of horrible things. And that's a bit like the imposter syndrome. The imposter syndrome is I'm here uh, CEO of a big multinational, but actually I got here just because my previous boss liked me and I was very lucky to be just there at the moment when he quit his job, so I was promoted in this place. It's not because I know what I, what I can do, and sooner or later people will find, find out that I'm incompetent. Apparently lots of people suffer from that, especially women, but not only women. And that is a kind of a shame, it's a kind of a deep doubt about your own capacities, thinking that there is something wrong with you, and thinking that others may find that out. It's, uh, I think it's, it's a very negative emotion, it's very difficult to do something about it, because even if you would tell people like that, but no, you are very good, you are very good, they will tell, they will think, oh, he's just saying that to please me, he's just telling me that uh, because he wants to comfort me, but actually he thinks that I'm really incompetent. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very difficult to treat, and uh, there are some ways to treat it, uh, one uh, way is, uh, or to approach it at least, uh, one way is trying to uh, ask yourself what proof do you have that you are so uh, less worthy, yeah? and, uh, and then uh, you have to find, uh, and then people often discover that they exaggerate, they think, uh, they think much worse than it actually is, uh, another tactic is to ask, uh, to find uh, what would your friends t tell about or think about you or your colleagues and you have to think about good friends or colleagues mm -hmm. who think very positively of you and think more about that and always thinking about the, the shameful uh, things. Uh, so it's some kind of cognitive uh, behavior therapy uh, where you line up and list things uh, uh, of what other people would think uh, the good things or other people would think about you and focus more on that. and, and uh, put it on a list and lay it on your uh, night cabin and every time you go to sleep go through the list to reprogram the brain to get out of this very destructive loop of, of shameful thought that's all an exaggeration because it's repeated again and again and it, it grains very deeply and try to break out of it uh, uh, so there are some tactics but it's not easy uh, at least uh. and, and the other big question is where does that come from and it's probably programmed in early infancy where you had parents that were constantly telling you you're no good, you're stupid, you're dirty uh, and that's what kind of programs you to think of yourself as somebody who is no good. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very bad way of, of, of education. And they feel that they're parasites and they're absorbing things from society and not give something back. That I don't know what the... I don't think that is... Well, the question is like of shame. I was wondering because um, it must be highly correlated with depression, right? Yeah, uh, people with shame have uh, easily fallen into depression. I think it depends uh, whether the, the shame is all the time there or whether you have bouts of shame. I think lots of people most of the time function pretty normally, but then if something bad happens or they feel depressed, they st all these shameful thoughts start coming up and they can completely switch to a different mode and become like a different person. I mean, I know somebody like that who can be very self-confident and cheerful one period and then completely disappeared and depressed another moment that you, it's difficult to, to understand why that happens. But in essence, the, the, the goal of the talk today is to how to create a better civilization and, and how to use uh, knowledge to do that. And that's, uh, so of course, very difficult, but very interesting uh, question, uh, um, how to approach this uh, eventually. Because um, you also had a lot of philosophers uh, in the 18th and 19th century, like Hume and uh, uh, others, uh, that tried to figure out, uh, uh, you could say, uh, a good civilization is one that uh, create, creates most happiness for all, uh, and trying to strive 
for that. Uh, so, so let's say an algorithm, in fact, to uh, to apply. Uh, but it's uh, still difficult uh, because of human uh, shortcomings and tendencies. And, um, so uh, it's uh, it's a very fascinating question. In, pre in general, these days we are talking about crisis and crisis and crisis, um, one or many. Uh, particular system theorists like Friedrich Capra, Capra and people like that, they, they believe that we are approaching a bifurcation point, uh, which is a uh, breakdown or breakthrough. So in that, in, that, uh, in that view, a social system as an automatic system undergoes crisis and metamorphosis. So what the, the question I think it, which is relevant is what we do at the at the verification point of the social system. How I mean historically we have seen many things like that that they can go either back to the origins. It's a very complex nonlinear system, I think it's very unpredictable. So, I mean, uh, at the moment I'm more pessimistic than I used to be a few years ago because if you see what has happened the last years with ISIS and Trump and Brexit and all these kind of very irrational reactions, mm -hmm. which I can explain to this model, it's the uncertainty that creates this uh, desire for totalitarian, simplistic a social system that give you clear rules that only make it worse, of course. Yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, the, the problem is that the alternative social system, it, it isn't there. We don't have a... Communism had kind of an image of how it should be. It didn't work, but at least they had kind of... A map. We don't have that yet, we have elements of it. But, but most people nowadays live outside or against this system, whatever that means. I mean, we are much, we are much less Conform, conforming with where the Victorians were or the 50 years yeah, ago. Yeah, but systems self-organize even if you don't want to be in a system. Just if you communicate with others, certain patterns will kind of emerge and sure, stabilize. Yeah. So uh, it's not as, as, as ever did in this PhD thesis. It's not because something is self-organizing that it doesn't constrain you in your actions. It's uh, Sure. Self These social systems, they have self-organized, but they have become very constraining, and yeah. Uh, you were okay. um, yeah, It's a bit different. I have a question about authenticity. Um, with the, the example of the uh, woman mathematician, that she, uh, because of the social system, she will develop a false self and not live authentically. Um, but I have, uh, I think the authenticity, it's, it's hard to understand because the, I think the authenticity is uh, partly, uh, it depends on the circumstances and possibilities. Like uh, in the hunter-gatherer societies, nobody wanted authentically to be a mathematician because there was no maths or mathematicians. So, uh, because the authenticity changes as well, uh, my question is, is there an authenticity completely independent of the social system? Or is the, so or the different social systems, are they, do they constitute the authenticity? Well, authenticity should not be, uh, I mean, some people use this kind of idealistic phrase like become what you are. It's as if your individuality somehow is somewhere already there inside you and just need to come out. I don't believe in that. You have certain potentials, but these potentials are infinite. That means that depending on the environment, these potentials will be realized in one way or in another way or in yet another way. But what the false self is, where you're forcing yourself to do certain things that you know you do, at least you feel that they don't fit you. But still, the, 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 the system tells you that is who you are and that is what you should do, and you should not think about mathematics or science or about anything else. Just think about organizing a party uh, in your home and decorating your home. That's what a good housewife should do and you feel that that's not what you want and that's not enough for you, then you are living a false life. 
So authenticity is not finding your true self because there is no one true self, but it's not being a false self. That means not living a life that was actually broken onto you by a system that doesn't know you and that doesn't care about you. So uh, in that sense, authenticity is just having the freedom to move in whatever direction you like and where you will not. Nobody knows. That depends on on the opportunities in the social system. There, there is no one so that people are born to be a mathematician. So that's how they got there that you said that uh, couldn't become a mathematician, but that's how they got there. They might maybe design some methods of uh, locating prey by by thinking about different yeah. locations and, and, and orientations mm -hmm. uh, yeah. to the sun and, uh, <laughs> and, and become a very uh, become a very uh, successful guide in his uh, in his band because of that uh, they wouldn't stop him from doing that <laughs> they wouldn't tell him no you are the one who cuts stones don't do anything else don't think about finding pay it's not your task well in the present social system they would tell you something like that. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, you, you know, maybe there are uh, various of uh, uh, social system control. Uh, for example, you know, in different countries, in different areas, uh, they're facing the uh, different uh, sub, uh, survival environment. Uh, you know, maybe the, the country is facing the war, maybe the, country, uh, the, the society is very peaceful, it's different. Also, the, the social system control is different. Mm. Uh, so, uh, if there uh, is there a, another mechanism to help the system transform from uh, a certain degree of control to another degree of control, uh, maybe, uh, for example, maybe the, the society is peace, and I feel. I feel I'm free, I have freedom, but um, the war is coming, I can't uh, do any. I can't do anything like uh, uh, so there is a transport. So if, if, if we can uh, try to uh, explain the mechanism to help the transport. That's, I would say, one of the unsolved problems in our project. I think uh, Martha has talked about that most deeply. There will be another seminar. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, because like the, this, this is a huge subject and we're still discussing uh, uh, so and so. Like, one is the programming and those mechanisms oh. of programming and like the, you know, yes. I, I see a lot of paradoxes in like how to like disable all this, all this programming and uh, uh, and we you know, the, the the biggest problem I see is that like any talk tends to like crystallize in new programs. You know, like any talk about like deep programming. So this thing. Uh, okay. Well, maybe my little bit of addition. You sometimes need programs to deprogram. So it's like. Uh, <laughs> There have been, there have actually been experiments like with people who were brainwashed into religious cults, and then they developed a program to deprogram them from the <laughs> religious cults, and it was quite controversial because they had sometimes had to kidnap people from a from a religious cult and then isolate them completely from anybody else from that cult that might want to bring them back. Uh -huh. But then apparently these methods worked in some way, but. Then there are of course ethical questions. Can you kidnap somebody to deprogram? <laughs> if afterwards, even then afterwards, they, they, they agree that they were happy that they have been deprogrammed. Uh -huh. it's, it's one of the difficulties. See, see, for me, I feel like you can't control where the wind blows, you can only control how you set up the sail. So, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Our job, the fact that we're aware of this and having this conversation now, our prerogative should be predicated on like, okay, so how do we like navigate it? So, and to kind of go back to what you guys are saying about being like pessimistic about like now being, being kind of difficult to integrate this into contemporary culture, I feel the fact that Donald Trump's here now, the fact that ISIS is like, like an imminent threat, 
these are kind of they're terrible things, but they're kind of good things because now like, the masses are aware that mm. it's actually a problem. And the fact that that's there, uh, it begs the question, what are we going to do about it? So that's the first step of it. And then the second thing, the fact that we live in this social media kind of world where we're used to building community on a digital platform, I feel like this is what I'm super excited to be alive right now because if we can take that and give that actual substance and actual direction where we can actually go and say, okay, cool, you're doing this individually, but then as a collective we're doing that, having that and then actually just moving towards like, put this way, the road is going to go straight as it goes and then it's going to turn. And we can't worry about where it bends. We can only go as far as, as we know it goes. And I feel like as long as we just like systematically move through the motions and like work on the narrative, we can paint a pretty picture. That, that's what I feel. So like, I, I, like for me, I'm like, it's going to be super hard for us to kind of get to a point where we can integrate this in society. But I feel like now is the perfect time to do it. Yeah. Five years down the line, yeah. ten years, maybe not because we might lose grasp. Global warming could get way worse. But right now, like. It's all right. It's getting cold. It's getting cold outside. Don't get me wrong, but I've got a coat. You know, so 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 yeah. Like I, I think it's gonna be okay. Uh, will there also be some practical practical consequences uh, to the research, like uh, advice for schools or something like that? How to uh, like tender the important? It's a bit early. I mean, we started a year ago basically with this project, so uh, we have already made an enormous progress theoretically, but. To already go to the practical stage, I think we're a little bit too yeah, soon. But we don't, 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 don't you experiment practically? I mean, there are communities that can be happily adapted and, and, and they try to. For example, I, I belong to a great uh, little uh, cooperative like that in Tolebeck. Uh, um, and, and there we are still lacking a clear set of programming and programming the, the programming <laughs> you, see, <laughs> you see what I mean? The, the people come in to, to, to this uh, endeavor saying that okay, this is another way of doing business and this is another way of, 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 of existing in this society but still there are, uh, you know we, 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 we definitely need a theoretical kind of um, framework where we can build, we can dismantle the first framework and build a new way, how to exchange goods and things, how to exchange money, how, what is the how how to connect with the with the rotten mechanism, <laughs> which is like you know the, the other society, the, I don't know Wall Street or whatever. I mean, how do you play the game without being being absorbed by the being? I think know. that's the answer. But well, I'm gonna let you go first because you, your hands are going on, man. So you take the floor, man. Yeah, it happens that I'm developing a method to create better uh, system. Uh, actually, it's an ecosystem. And uh, for me, the answer lies in the two uh, last bullet points: uh, <clears throat> the day and us. And then when we realize that day is us, I believe that we do have the answer. Um, and therefore, it's a question of responsibility because you cannot never add a transfer of responsibility. And it's a question of self sovereignty, uh, meaning the mastery of the kingdom, kingdom of selves, the doubt, emotions, and deeds. And basically, <coughs> I have a couple of remarks, um, if you may. Um, we talked about high keys, uh, and I'm thinking about non hierarchical systems. Uh, we thought about gatherers and uh, tribes, uh, but Alexis Tocqueville also said that any small group has a natural tendency for self-organization, so I would believe it's a question of size. Why size? Because of uh, social trust. Um, I'm going to go fast. Um, we talked about, uh, the young lady that talked about dependence, and I would propose the notion of interdependence, which themself, uh, itself uh, implies the notion of reciprocity, and which Reciprocity is the, the builder of communities, communire, to uh, strengthen together through the process of uh, mutual gifts. But I'm not setting time and neither in, in nature. But then the, the question of money steps in. Currencies, should we use a, a currency in a community? Or is strict accounting would destroy the community? That's a, because it would induce mistrust. About um, <coughs> the um, question of uh, suicide bombings, I. Uh, read uh, an interesting book by uh, John Clippinger called The Crowd of One, uh, who said, proposed that uh, suicide bombers uh, actually they pro they, uh, do an act of extreme reciprocity. 
uh, toward the organization that uh, uh, hosts them. We talked uh, many times about negative emotions, and I would uh, see the solution in positive emotions. How can we reward the set of positive emotion, like recognition, like a resonance, and, uh, and stuff like that? Uh, therefore, we would switch from a, a scheme of external rewards and punishment to uh, intrinsic rewards uh, that are rooted in, in positive emotion again. We also thought about the boundaries, which implies the in and out, ostracism, and uh, the, uh, the other one, the, uh, what was the other one? Ex Yes, xenophobia. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of ecosystems, boundaries are not clear. Because of the synergistic relationships, it never, there is not very uh, an outside of the group. Um, an ecosystem likes uh, perturbations in, in unlike systems who uh, try to express them. We talked about education a bit, and I would say that we do not have an education system, we do not have an instruction system, mm -hmm. where we have programs at school, we program people to, uh, you know, be fit for uh, the industrial society. And also the question of uh, a denial of self, which comes back to the notion of uh, self sovereignty. Uh, and the last uh, thing, uh, we heard a lot about should, should, should. Is there any uh, relation with schooled? Schooled? Okay. As, a, as, a, as a root? It's an option question. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's a translation. So basically what we're doing with a group of people is just like we create an app that tries to apply the, uh, the principle of ecosystems to uh, human society. And uh, we're developing that now. Now when are you going to come and talk about it in the summer? Yeah. <laughs> because um, I met Kadel. And uh, he expanded the scope of it. So, um, yes, yeah. so I would like to have some some um, something to uh, to show and uh, that we can experiment. But definitely, what we, you are working on is the other side of what we do, and uh, that would complement uh, quite well. I'm in a very similar position as well. And to go back to what you said about the game, um, I know Francis has seen the Planet Earth video. Um, has anyone else seen that in the room? So I don't want to repeat myself. <laughs> okay, so essentially, um, you said something really interesting about the game. So the way I kind of see things sometimes is that life is kind of like playing a game almost. So I feel like a way in which you could take a social system and integrate this into contemporary culture is by offering a platform where you can literally say to like 18 to 24 year olds, I say to start with, that would be like a good demographic to start with because then you haven't got to worry about the complexities of going through normal education stuff and people are themselves, they're free. And basically, the way, the way it would work is, is, is very simple. So the case of saying, okay, so you're here now, and by doing that, you'd aggregate the internet in its current form. So you're taking, you know how like um, we're, we're like, um, like the Ubers, the Airbnbs, all your social medias will be built into your profile. You'd have like a really cool inventory feature. So anything that you have which is useful towards like the planet, like my laptop, my, my camera, any spare rooms I have, it'll be built into your profile, like your online avatar. And essentially, you basically, you tell the game, what you want, in, what, what your goals are. So essentially, you're like, okay, so in three years' time, four years' time, I want to do this. And then essentially, we've got algorithms that deconstruct that and deliver you consumable missions every day that help you ascertain whatever you're going for in synergy to everyone else and what they're going on. So, you know, a really good, really simple way to kind of imagine it is almost like Grand Theft Auto. So, like, you know how like, when you're online and then like, people are playing variable missions, before you know it, these two people, this model comes over here and connects with this photographer. And before you know it, you've got a job. You're bringing a brand here and they're making money. So it's, and, and, and yeah, so it, it's kind of like taking all of these ideologies, kind of like what, what we're saying here about like the, the ideologies of, of the global brain and integrating them into something that's consumable and people can actually go and, and, and leverage to actually go and start taking these steps towards what we're going for. I think that'd be really, really cool. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be quite interested to do um, a seminar as well. Like, it would be great to, to control everything. Oh, no, no, it, 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 <laughs> well, it, it wouldn't be controlling because it would almost, it wouldn't even be like an owner of it per se. Because then, you, then you're kind of building the same thing again. There is no owner of the social system. That's, 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 that's what I mean. So it, it'd kind of just be, it'd be, it'd be self-organising in, in, in its own right. It's 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 more of a case of it's it's literally the sense of, of being of, of being kind of 
as a book is for love, you know. So that, that's that's a game. Well, it's, me, or it's it's so so essentially uh, as as the game, like you are the you are your own avatar. It's a virtual environment. So it's like transmedia. So in the sense that um, you kind of have a blueprint online that you then go and action in the real world. If that makes sense. So companies like Google are already trying to do mm -hmm. that. Eh? They try to uh, find all the information about you that's possible and try to predict what you want, <coughs> and what you, what you, uh, where you will go to, and mm -hmm. what you will order, and so on. So it's already, uh, it's already happening. Already happening, and it can be misused by governments because they don't know uh, a lot yeah. about you, your, even your character. There are now algorithms. They can check your Facebook and assess your character better than your spouse. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, this information it uh, can be used very uh, to, for good purposes. But can also the, re the, the reason why like, I use the term a game is because like my generation I know is very distracted. So like it, it, and, that, and that's the thing. Like so it's a case of kind of saying if, if we came out here now with the solution, no one would care. Reason why is because they care more about their supreme backpack than actually helping the planet because that's just the level of awareness that we're at. So it's almost kind of like saying like, okay, you see this shiny piece of candy here, kids? Yeah, well, you can play with this here and get everything you want and actually have like goals and purpose and stuff. And then systematically, kind of just over time, you start providing that level of mindfulness and that level of awareness to the point where it's like, okay, now maybe I've learned how I can work with these people and I've broken that boundary then then over time you kind of move through that and the reason why it's kind of interesting is because the way in which the world works now is through youthification so generally speaking kids adopt things first and then parents get it afterwards in the way that kids use Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook first and then all the people use it so it's a case of being like okay so why don't we really pioneer here to the point where no one even realizes what's going on and then it's, oh that was a pleasant surprise now things are solved and don't get me wrong, it starts off by making kind of self-orientated, like predicated on what they want. But then before you know it, it's not too hard to get to get like other missions in where like, okay, well, why don't we just clean up the litter out of the ocean? Why don't we do this? And before you know it, like these things would actually be actionable, especially if, if there's still kind of those um those kind of mechanics that mean that they get kind of get something out of it as well. So like you know how we were talking earlier about um reward mechanisms. Like that, that kind of that, that's very frequent in games. That you, you do things, you get XP, which is also a form of currency, as you just said. So it, it's like it's it's, just, it's basically a way in which like we take all of the things we're talking about and try and make something right now that we can actually go to market with and start actually experimenting with like the ide ideologies that we have. I feel like that's that's kind of like it's you know, like a bit of gamification of life. <laughs> Yeah. And gamification will be very important to mm -hmm. uh, make everything into a game to be more uh, adherent to therapy or uh, to be healthy or to create a better world. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I think uh, uh, all the people are already trying also to figure that out and to create something like that. Yeah. The problem with like mm -hmm. the problem with like Facebook, Google kind of making it is that they have such a myriad of services already. They have to like move everything with that. If that makes sense. So Facebook's right now, it's got like its profile, it's got its directory and everything. So for them to make it, they have to move a lot and they have a lot of users and a lot of risk and their stakeholders are like, yo, we can't lose our revenue. Whereas if we have a new entity that is like a subsidiary of the global brain, that's like, that this is our vision and we just make that first. It's not diluted, there's no compromise. It's just a case of being like, okay, well, we've done that now. And and, and the cool thing about like the, like the way we branded it, we've called it planet.earth. So, it, and that's like our domain, so like it's literally like planet.earth and the dot represents the dots that we're connecting to like make things happen. Planet.earth? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the domain that we have. But where would be the control of, of you? It seems like, uh, I mean, not you, mm -hmm. it sounds like you would control everything. Oh, no, no, no. Where would be the control of me? For because my customer. machine will tell me the whole time what to do and how much Oh, no, 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 no. So, so I just said it's, one it's, it's, or it's, ten aims. It's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a, it's, I mean that that's one way to kind of look at it, but it's, but you don't understand is like if you don't want to go on, then you totally can, and, and you always have control over what you do. It's almost like free roam mode. So there are there is like a narrative that would like almost give you options of what you can do. But then if you if you want if you one day say, well, I don't want to be a photographer anymore, and I want to be a painter, then everything that you've kind of all, all of the all of the good things that you benefited from going down that narrative can now be transacted over there as well. I think that I think the, the the main focus for me is centered on making people actually engage fully with something in one moment, and and always kind of being engaged and, and focused. 
Because it's it's better to be one hundred on something than like fifty on loads of things. Does that make sense? What's your concern? Yeah, yeah. What's, what's, your, what's your concern? Well, that if I just I can choose an aim and then the program will decide how to reach it. But mm -hmm. maybe I I will see the possibility. Put it this way, like <laughs> like like the one the one the one credit I can have, but like the guy who's designing it is like he's really really insane. He's really really insane at like interface design. If if I put it in your hand right now, you'd be like, oh, I get it. Like that's and like I mean, I, I could happily send you like um like a, a prototype if you wanted to have a go, and you could then that might kind of reduce that. I can't really reduce it anymore without you kind of feeling it and experiencing it for yourself. Otherwise, it'd just be my words. So. Hmm.